I'll just go through this very uh, quickly. Um, the challenges that we have. Hold on. Easy, easy, easy. So, so here we go. So here we go. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor. It's going to work out. What's happening in Chicago right now in the migrant crisis? We're looking at warehouses being used, police stations, schools, libraries, all of these different places. I want to give you a little bit of a background on how do we get to this point and where the federal government is and what's happening in Chicago. So this will be a deep dive. I'm not a flyby, and I can sit here and talk with you all night long. So this is what you got me here for, so I'm available. I'm not running. Okay. Where are the migrants coming from in this wave? The migrants in large part are coming from Venezuela. What's happened in Venezuela? The United States, after the President Hugo Chavez came to power almost 15 years ago, he has since uh, has died. Uh, he was a socialist and was doing a lot of economic reforms. There was a backlash against his government by the United States. So we started uh, doing a embargo blocking his oil sales. Then from there, we started the sanctions under the Trump administration. So what's happened in the last 15 years in Venezuela is they've had the equivalent of three great depressions. So this is one of the wealthiest countries on earth if they could sell their oil, but they've had the equivalent of three great depressions. So now over seven million people have had to leave their country. Many of the people that you're seeing in these shelters and police stations over had a house, had an apartment, had a place to stay. But because we've taken them out of the foreign exchange process, the United States government, you cannot use a U.S. credit card in Venezuela. They cannot sell their oil to the United States. They have suffered three great depressions. And because we're the only country in the region and in the world that has a problem with Venezuela, they want to leave. And in turn, the bordering countries end up welcoming them and transporting them to the next city, to the next city, all the way to the Mexican border. So from Caracas, Venezuela, to Chicago, Illinois, is 2,499 miles. You can walk to Caracas, Venezuela. You can drive to Caracas, Venezuela. You can bicycle to Caracas, Venezuela. You don't need to fly. You don't need to take a boat. It's one contiguous landmass is what I want people to understand. And then we're going to go into a deeper dive on how did we get to this current challenge. The migrant crisis timeline starts when Hugo Chavez is elected. There's uh, repercussions. The United States wasn't happy. Um, Mr. Chavez has since uh, deceased. And then uh, Maduro came in there. And the United States got even more uh, selective in its prosecution and sanctions against them. Then. He had a failed coup attempt in 2018. Then the United States puts in sanctions on the oil. They also own the Citgo Oil Company. The Venezuelan oil company has hyperinflation. We're talking about the 4 and 5% that we have on eggs and milk. They started having 75 and 100 and 200% inflation. So people could no longer eat there. And now the imports resume, eventually increasing to 153,000 barrels of crude oil a day. They had been totally shut down. President Biden, three weeks ago, lifted some of the sanctions so they could start selling oil so fewer people would be leaving. Why do we have to deal with this? Because there are over 400,000 people from Colombia and up the Pan American Highway that are trying to get here. So this is only the beginning of the wave. We're going to talk about it a little bit more. In Venezuela, highly dependent on fossil fuel, the sanctions have uh, contributed to their economic hardship, and their inflation rate has been hovering at around 300 percent. That is why people have had to leave the country to come here. The impact on the city of Chicago and our region specifically has created more social unrest. There's been a disruption of public services. I, like many of you, have gone into a police station, and it is simply awful that the this reduces the amount of time from which the police can leave and get to our houses when we're experiencing crime. This is why we all have to deal with this here. The last part, 
is the uncertainty of the next steps. I was with Mayor Johnson this past week in Washington, D.C. He asked the President's Chief of Staff for $5 billion in additional funding so that we can offset this, not just for Chicago, but the six urban markets that Governor Greg Abbott is sending migrant populations to. I want to uh, tell you about that. So Governor Greg Abbott, the governor of Texas, created a program. Oh, and you don't have to worry about taking pictures of the slide. This fancy staff I have, they've got a QR code. The slides are going to be available. <laughs> You're going to be able to go online and get your pictures. So we're going to go high tech. So there is a QR code that you'll be able to download your photos um, that you took in the lobby, as well as any of the presentation material I want you to have. Um, so Governor Greg Abbott, what did he do specifically? Governor Abbott created in April of 2022. Mayor Lori Lightfoot was on front of this and on top of it. She started trying to combat the wave that what Mr. Abbott was doing. He created Operation Lone Star, and the purpose of that was to send this migrant population to six cities, this is his quote, that had Democratic mayors to take this population. So he's receiving money from ICE and other agencies in FEMA, keeping the money, and then sending the people on. I sent out a letter three weeks ago, no, three weeks ago asking the Department of Justice and the Department of Homeland Security to investigate Governor Greg Abbott on child smuggling. So we first have to protect children. There are some seedy elements that are now coming around these police stations. Some people prey on children and prey on vulnerability. This is a portal, this is an entryway to prostitution and sex trafficking. I want it to stop. When we have children and families sleeping outside in 30 degree weather, you and I are walking as fast as we can to a bus shelter, to the train, or to our car. We don't want to stay outside in 30 degrees. They come from a region, in large part, that 60 degrees is cold. They've never experienced anything like this. The reason I'm bringing this up, and I can mention this on this Sunday, our scriptures have a lot to say about the strangers, the migrants, and the refugees. So I don't want our community to turn on one another. We're going to see our way through this, but I want us to be informed as to what's going on. We're going to collaborate with our elected officials. Maybe there's some things that they have in the works I don't know about, things that I'm doing I need to share with them so we can have united force in front so we can share with you. I've asked all these elected officials to come out. I want to thank the ones that were available today. Others were available, but others were not available, but they sent representatives. Any other representative of an automatic office or state rep, rep office I have not acknowledged, will you please stand? I don't want to, I know there were some chiefs of staff. What office? Ronnie Mosley, thank uh, Alderman Mosley. Yep, so Ronnie Mosley's office. Alderman Yancey, thank him. Uh, Alderman Lamont Robinson um, had sent a representative, so thank you all. I want you to know where the resources are. We're going to collaborate with elected officials. I've got a few action items that I would like to see them do. But let's go on into this housing. Um, currently, there are more than 68,000 Chicagoans experiencing homelessness in Chicago. We have to deal with both and. We can't have Chicagoans being stepped over to help other populations. I feel your pain. I understand. I've sent the letter off to our Secretary of HUD, uh, Mar Marcia Fudge. She's going to respond back to me. There are some other initiatives that are coming out. First of all, the state of Illinois is a sanctuary state. Chicago's a sanctuary city. This is not Chicago's burden alone. Some of these persons ought to be given the opportunity, both our residents and some of the migrants, to go to other parts of the state. 
to go to Peoria, to go to Moline, to go to Evanston, to go to Kenilworth, to go to Oak Park, go to some of the nice places as well, go to Oak Brook. Everyone deserves a better shot at life. So we've got 68,000 people that are homeless that are Chicagoans. And a large part of those are veterans. Um, I don't have the slide right now, but I've got to get it for you. But you need to see what the federal government has done over the last 40 years with public housing. They have continued to erode and take away and reduce the amount of public housing. That is why we need to vote our interest and vote our numbers, come out and vote, so we can get back to the majority. Congresswoman Maxine Waters <coughs> over the financial services had proposed $150 billion for affordable housing. Listen, that would eliminate all housing issues in America. So I don't take the vote lightly when they talk about $100 billion going to all these wars and all this defense abroad when we need to have some investments right here in our country. And I started looking at the numbers, $100 billion. $100 billion. That reminds me of the young rapper, Shay. They had asked him, uh, could he spell millions? And he said, M-I-L, Illions. Well, <laughs> when they... When they talk about these billions, it's B-I-L, aliens. It's so many, and they act like it's not consequential. $100 billion could eradicate, could find the cure to eliminate Alzheimer's. $100 billion could eliminate Parkinson's. Don't get me started on what $100 billion could do in a peacetime. And a fun fact I looked up, is um, in 2001, we had 9-11, 2002, the Bush administration created the Homeland Security. I think they were initially funded at $6 billion in 2002, and then they got up to $19 billion by 2003. Who knows how much is in the Homeland Security budget now? Give me a stand up. You may win. Huh? $103 billion is what we're paying in Homeland Security. That's not to the Department of Defense. That's just for Homeland Security. So I'm telling you, we've spent over a trillion dollars in the last 20 years just on Homeland. That's not the Department of Justice. That's not the Central Intelligence Agency. <laughs> That's just Homeland Security. So unless we start finding another way to resolve conflicts without war, that budget's going to go even higher. And that's $100 billion, by the way. Um, housing disparities. Black individuals in Chicago have two times the foreclosure rates of whites. The discrimination in the lending practices continues. We need to have the 14th Amendment applied, equal justice under the law. This disparity is gutting and ripping out our communities. The residents that live in the south suburbs, they were targeted with subprime loans. Subprime loans simply meant, and I first read about it in a Red Book report in 1993, the Federal Bank uh, Reserve of Boston, and they describe subprime as three percentage points or 300 basis points over prime. So we pay more money for less. Don't you think subprime ought to be less and shouldn't cost you more? You know what prime beef is? Come on, like subprime? <laughs> Same difference. We're paying more for less. That systemic discrimination and racism has not been rooted out of the system. We're still overcharged for basic services. Second part, black homes in the Chicago have appreciated at two-thirds the citywide average. African Americans, if there are 77 communities in the city of Chicago, we primarily live in 22 communities on the south and the west side. 
And our home values on average are two thirds, real close to three fifths of a human, huh? It's two thirds the value of the citywide average. This is a problem. I am working with Congresswoman Maxine Waters in the Congressional Black Caucus on housing equity to stop the appraisers from discriminating on our housing values. And thus, as a consequence of the discrimination, the black community has the largest foreclosure housing losses and other things. Action items, the cost of living, accessibility, safety, access to food, access to education, access to transportation. In order to have a healthy community, these are the building blocks that we first have to have access to. Reverend Martin Luther King was not just concerned about a seat on the bus. That was the symbolism of it. He was more concerned about, he was a man of God, the mass transit system. When we have fewer buses going downtown and less reliable mass transit rail to go downtown, when we don't have the red line going to the hundreds and to the southeast corridor, we have been excluded, economically asphyxiated from the most industrious and productive parts of the city. The Chicago Transit Authority, say Chicago Transit Authority, goes to Skokie, Illinois. The Chicago Transit Authority goes to Evanston, Illinois. The Chicago Transit Authority goes to Forest Park, Illinois. The Chicago Transit Authority goes out towards Bridgeview and beyond, but doesn't cover all of Chicago. Do you see the problem? I want you to look the next time you're driving down the Eisenhower when you see those train stops that are closed. That is unbelievable that you would close a mass transit site. Who lived in those neighborhoods? What happened to the housing after they closed the mass transit? Everything went down, down, down. What happened in 2013 that we should remember in 2023? We had the largest school closure of elementary schools in America. So what happens 10 years later? Our population is shrinking. We have more walkers than strollers because they closed the elementary schools. Let me start. NPR reported from August of last year to December of this year, they will spend $252 million on the migrants. $252 million. 17,000 17, migrants come into this city, and just in Chicago. If we just break that in half and they become families, you got 8,500 families. Hispanics have 3.5 children. I'm submitting to you, in one generation, just one generation, the black vote will be null. They will have an additional 24,000 people on the voting rolls, along with the Hispanic population already here. They're playing chess, and you all are playing checkers. You are damning our youth, our next generation, to poverty by you all doing these political speeches. One generation, our youth, our vote will be null in all these six sanctuary cities. And what are you going to do about that? Thank you very much. Um, the first thing we have to do is to make sure that those that are coming here unlawfully stop. I don't have anything to do with person's reproduction levels. If people want to have more children, you certainly can. Second part is, two-thirds of our hemisphere you know speak Spanish. They're not Americans in general. So there's a natural balance of people that are non-English speaking in our own hemisphere that can walk up here all the time. The third part that we have to be very much concerned about is we can't lose our land and be moved off of it because of government policy. I am focused on the housing issues because the housing and the jobs is what keeps us as residents of this district and in the residents of the Illinois. The first stat I threw out to you was 200,000 people, African-Americans have moved off our land in the first two decades. 
That's a federal issue. That's why I work with Congresswoman Maxine Waters. That's why we've introduced with the Congressional Black Caucus to have additional funding to make sure we have housing. I can't hear you, sir. What do he say? He can't hear what? I'm sorry. He didn't hear me or what? Oh. I'm sorry. I can't hear you, sir. Sir, if you could come back, if you can come back to the mic, is what we will do, Congressman, yep. is we will have Let's let him finish his follow question, then we'll get yeah. back. We have not addressed the issue. Okay, I'm you, sorry. You wait a minute. You dance all around it. Okay. You do not, you do not give any specific solutions on what you want to do. Anybody can stop okay, having no, children. Okay, no, no, thank you. Let me Hold finish, on. my brother. No, no, let, let me, me ask you. Can you help me with the solution you'd like to see me do? Surely, I can help you with the solution. I can give you real, I can, I can give you one simple answer. Send them back. That's the only solution. That's it. Other than that, they will surpass us. It is math. It's simple math. They will overtake us in numbers at the rate that they have kids. They cannot be U.S. citizens. You are dooming our next generation to subservitude. I'm telling you this. Okay. It's just simple math. I know. But That's let me it. It's simple math. I'm very good Count. at math. Let me share something with you. Most of the persons that are trying, that are here right now, under the technical definition, do not qualify for asylum. I'm not concerned about the, I'm concerned about the children that they have. They will be U.S. citizens, and they will have a voting block. All we have to do now is look at the Hispanic voting block they have now. They get everything they want. Look at our communities. You should see the schools that they have as compared to the schools that our children attend. It is simple math. Count. That's all you have to do. Okay, thank you. One generation. Thank you, sir. They had a... Uh refugee job fair, and it was put on by the, I believe it was Rogers Parks Chambers of Commerce. No Haitians, no Africans were invited. I called both places that I'm working with, African House, Haitian Museum, they knew nothing about it, okay? Another case, they are going to, according to the University of Chicago, I attended a luncheon last week, and they had a representative there, a doctor, I can't pronounce her name. She's in mental health. Well, they are training Spanish-speaking uh, non-professional people to come in and help the Venezuelan Spanish-speaking people with trauma, as if the African and Haitian people are not experiencing trauma. <laughs> So I emailed her and told her that we would be very happy to be a part of that program to send our people there. I have not heard from her yet. So bottom line, without me going through some other stuff that you all don't even want to hear. Uh, we want to hear we want to be fair so other people can ask now, the questions. No, I want to be fair, okay. uh, but maybe I can talk to you on the personal side. There Absolutely. needs to be more open lines of communication into the Haitian Museum of Chicago and to the African organization. It should be open up. If you're helping migrants, uh, immigrants, or whatever, don't ignore the African and the Haitians. That's happening now, okay? And Brother Kupla Torre left this proposal for me to give to you and a book written about the black heroes of the fire department. And so I'm supposed to give them to you at some point, and I will. Thank okay. you. Thank, thank you so much. Um, I did have a conversation with the city manager for uh, immigrants, and I specifically brought up who was speaking Creole that could talk with the Haitian immigrants, and they had no one on staff that was speaking in Creole. This is a concern. This is a concern that I do have. And let's follow up. So, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to get to everyone. I ask that if you could make on the light-skinned um, Spanish-speaking immigrants, and they're not focused on the black immigrants. Um, last week, we had 30 families. We needed to translate in Creole um, how to apply for asylum, how to get phones, how to get tablets. We don't have any support from the city. We don't have any support from the federal government. 
These are just volunteers that I was able to recruit in order to get to do this work. We had the general manager of the Hyatt that was willing to give us space. We had a, a it's called the Dirty Laundry. It's a black owned business on, in Hyatt Park that was willing to give those immigrants an opportunity to clean their clothes. So when people are very upset and they're speaking, I want you to be cognizant of the fact that it's not just these light-skinned Spanish, which are black descendants, but light-skinned Spanish people. There are immigrants like my parents who come from Haiti, okay? I'm first generation. There's a lot of us here in Illinois. There's a lot of us that have been supporting the Jackson family for years, and you, we already know that your father supports us. But I want you to remember us because we do need you to take that, that title to transfer the interference that the United States government has had in the country of Haiti so that we can stay home. Don't nobody wanna be in no 30 degree weather when we got 80 degree weather in Haiti. Don't nobody want any um, gang affiliated governments. We want to be free, we want to be democratic, but we're coming to the United States because we don't have any help. The president of Haiti was assassinated. There were 14,000 of us in Texas, as you know, and what happened to us? We were bust. And when we were whipped with the horses, all of a sudden we weren't on the news anymore and it was only the Spanish. So when we're thinking about these immigrants and these migrants that are here in Chicago, I don't want you to forget the black ones, like my family, like my friends. I want you to take care of us. I want you to help us and I want you to encourage other congressmen, other black congressmen, to encourage the United States to stop interfering. We don't want to be here. We would love to stay home. So please, congressmen, if you can, do that for us. Thank you. You want me to hold? I don't need no mic. I want to hold my mic. I don't like man holding my, my stick. Brother Tyrone? Yes. Uh, check, check, check. <laughs> Transparency, that's my brother. That's my brother. We disagree, uh, but that's my brother. Um, I just want to say anyway, what the sister said, I don't give a damn about no Joe Biden. So if that lady want to pass out something about that, that's her free will. Y'all can't be forcing democracy on people. She got the right, just like you got the right to say vote for Joe Biden, I got the right as somebody who represents formerly incarcerated person to say Joe Biden and Clinton 94 crime bill yeah. created that. And we haven't recovered from that. The only asylum seekers that's perpetually discriminated against in this country by everybody is formerly incarcerated people. They have 18,000 homeless ex-cons, yet they're around here talking about public safety. You don't even know what these men are. Then you let more ex-convicts -con in here in the name of migrants. But they want to tell you that it's the low, this on the state, it's on, it's on uh, the, 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 I mean the Republicans. All politics is local. Every in this state, don't let them fool you. From the top, from, from the lieutenant governor, to Tony Pragwinkle, to the mayor, to the police chief, to the state's attorney, to, to, to the aldermen, to the congressperson, to the state reps, all are black. You got 150 elected black positions and our communities look the way they look. And if I say something, if I say something, if it's not with my brother, he just got there. They want to legislate for us without ever bringing us at the table. I did 21 years in the prison. What they gonna tell me about what we need? They ain't never spent one day in the cell. But they legislate for your nephew, cousin, and son. The furthermore, ain't no kids in here. Ain't no teenagers in here. Over 150 murdered young men from ages 16 to 24, and ain't no kids in here. That's the problem. You old people, y'all keep voting the same way, hook, line, and sinker, without ever holding them account. And the very babies gonna kill y'all ass. These kids are these little wolves. Hey, ain't nothing else nobody saying no more important than this. Hey, hey, wrap your ass. Ain't nothing nobody saying more important than this. I'm tired of y'all playing games with these babies. These babies gonna start driving y'all, but they already doing it. 
They gonna kill you. I think y'all getting contacted now. 60% unemployment rate for 18 to 24, and you got money for migrants. Hey, 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 y'all, I'm telling y'all, stop letting these people rhyme fast. It's a game being played, bro. Ain't no way. And how we got guns, no, no, no. how we got extended clips, 100-round drums, Glock 6, cocaine, heroin, and the weed, 99% of all dispensaries are owned by white men. Y'all got to be out y'all damn mind. We should be marching in Washington. We should be crushing them. They shouldn't even be allowed in our neighborhood. That's what's finna happen. The immigrants can come into this country and get a stipend, link, a free roaming board, free child care, and some of them are getting social security. And when my ancestors were released from slavery, they got the clothes on their back. But yet, they were told to be happy. So why am I and everyone in this country footing the bill for people who are non-Americans, who don't vote, who don't fight in any of our wars, who've never paid a tax, and we're told that if we say anything, we're xenophobic. Tell me why. Tell us all why. I, I want to know. I think it's wrong. I mean, it shouldn't happen, but this is a, a U.S. immigration system we have that is broken.